Hello and welcome to our eighth session of the study of salvation. Uh, we just got started the last session on our 15 different words that has to do with salvation, the, those big, as I call them, 50 cent words. We didn't get very far, we got to look at conversion. Looking back, we saw the conversion, there was a lot to cover. We talked about repentance, we talked about faith. And remember, repentance is a voluntary turning from sin. Faith is turning to Christ. With uh, repentance, we turn from sin. Faith, we turn to Christ. We reject sin, we accept Christ. Okay, and I give you a verse over in Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Paul's writing, he says, I testify both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So today we're going to look at something a little different. And I said that wrong. Paul didn't write it. Paul said it. Luke wrote to Acts. We know that. So anyway, we're going to look at this. We're going to see substitution, reconciliation, and possibly propitiation. We'll see how it goes if I don't get on a sidetrack someplace here and detain us a little bit. But we're going to start off with a substitution. Over in 1 Peter 3.18, it says, For God hath also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that, the, that he might bring us to God. So Christ also has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So this is a substitution. Some, somebody taking the place of something else or something else taking the place of something else. It's a, something working and different. We see a lot in sports. You know, if you watch a basketball game, we'll see a timeout and one man will come out and another man go in and take his place. And so we see this substitution happens a lot in life happens a lot as we look at Scripture. We see the need for a substitution. That's what we're going to look at right here. The substitution refers to the act where somebody or something is going to replace. There's a temporary in the Old Testament where the sheep died for the shepherd. I remember we the story of Abraham and Isaac. We went up, he said, you take your son Isaac, Abraham, up to the, the mount that I'll show you, and you're going to sacrifice him. So Abraham did the whole thing. He took up, he had the fire going, he had everything going, had his son bound up, ready, laid him up, or he's ready to had the knife up. And God said, whoa, stop. And he looked over and there was a ram in the thicket. He went over and took that ram and sacrificed a ram. That ram took the place of Isaac. So that's that place of substitution for us. Over in the New Testament, we look at a more permanent substitution. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10.4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. So that Old Testament symbolism that we've seen where it was a temporary thing, we get into the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now listen to the difference. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we're going to see that Christ who knew no sin, so we got to be permanent sacrifice. Now, one time he went in, he sacrificed himself, and it was completed. If you remember the story when from the crucifixion and at the temple, the veil was ripped from the top to the bottom, and so that gives us access. He paid the price, so we have a, a permanent uh, substitute. He went and he paid the price for our sins. Okay, so we go a little bit further, and we see that the need now for reconciliation. Okay, so we've had talked about conversion, we talked about repentance, we've talked about faith, and we've talked about substitution. Somebody had to go take the place. Christ did that. He was our substitute. Now we're going to have reconciliation. That means to cover something in the Old Testament. And it's used as atonement, reconciliation, and sometimes as a temporary covering. But the idea here, uh, that was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it means to change from enmity, from an enemy, to a friend. There's a friction going on between two people or two groups, and it changes then from that being an enemy to a friend. It, uh, we know that friends get and have problems. Uh, we talk about a lot of times if you're familiar with the workplace night where you have union workers and, and management, and they'll, they'll be at odds, and so they'll bring somebody in to reconcile the differences and help them to get together to try to contract. So that's the real reconciliation here. Over in first or in Colossians 1.21, he says this, and you that were sometimes alienated, and notice, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. You who were enemies of God. You know, we, we talk about that sometimes when we look at the change from an enemy to a child of God, from an enemy to a friend of God. And sometimes God's friends and his children don't act like his friends and his children. We still act sometimes like that. We have those enemy traits, but we know that through the blood of Christ we've been reconciled. And that's a one-time thing. It's a permanent thing. The sacrifice has been made. We've been reconciled to him. Uh, some examples in the Bible talks about in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, where it says if you have, uh, you take your sacrifice to the altar, you're offering up to the altar, and if you have something against your brother, you go make it right. 
you reconcile and you come back and offer your offering. And over in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about a man and his wife. And if they, the man puts them away, then they need to they can be reconciled to get back together. Uh, over in uh, Romans 5, 10, and 11, I'll just read this to you. It talks about God and the sinner. So let's look at Romans 5, 10, and 11. It says, For if when we were enemies, okay, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. For look at atonement, uh, that payment. We'll see that in a little bit when we look at the propitiation. But the idea here is that we've been reconciled to God, and that's, a, that's so important. See, if that reconciliation doesn't take place, then God can't look at you. God can't bless you. You're still in your sin. So you need to be changed for that enemy, brought into God's family. And, and this is a process that we're looking at here now. When we talked about being justified, righteousness, justification, these things, they all happen to go together. But I want you to note, uh, just a, a quick look back. If we, When we looked at conversion, remember what happened. I had to turn from my sin, repent, and I had to put my faith in Christ. Everything we've looked at since then is the, the groundwork. God's laid the groundwork. He sent His Son to lay the groundwork. So the, the substitution, the propitiation, the reconciliation, all these things we're going to look at could take place. We start with conversion. But the only way that man has a hope of salvation is because of the work of Christ. God sent His Son to do that work clear back over in Genesis. It was in Genesis 3.15. He's talked about this. the Son was going to come that there's going to be a Savior someday. Well, he finally came, and he did all of these things, prepared the groundwork, so none needs to be lost. The Bible says over in First Peter that, that, that all should come to repentance. So the idea is that we're going to see here, as he talks about that reconciliation, we've been reconciled, the implications of reconcile, reconciliation, those where there was an animosity, there had to be a, a difference, there had to be a split someplace. And the idea is then reconcile the offended party now looks at the other party different. Now, see why we look different now? We just looked back over at 2 Corinthians 5.21. Why? Because he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness. So then we're now clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So we, hey, the Father loves the Son, and we're clothed with His righteousness, so then we're acceptable to Him. And we'll talk about that justification later. And we'll go a little bit farther. There's two phases to it. God has reconciled the world to himself through Christ. Over in uh, 2 Corinthians, let me turn over there real quick. In 5.19, he says this, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What's he telling us there? He said that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So through, him, through his Son, he reconciled the world to himself. But notice what he says at the end of that verse. And he gives us a little bit of a, a need right here. He says that uh, hath committed unto us, you and I, the word of reconciliation. In other words, we have the gospel. We have the message to take to the world to say, you don't have to be an enemy of God. You can now be a child of God, a friend of God. You can be reconciled because of what Christ did. He did all the work, but you had to put your faith and trust in him. Now man is to reconcile himself to God through Christ. One verse down farther in verse 20, 2 Corinthians 5. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you and Christ did be ye reconciled to God. So we see the, the complete picture now. Not only do we have the, the message of reconciliation, but we're ambassadors. We're representatives of God. It's our, our responsibility. It's a command. It's not a suggestion that we go share the gospel. We're commanded to go share the gospel, not only in our words and our deeds, but we're just live that life out there so people see it, that they hear. So we see right here all the work that Christ did, and now we have the responsibility. He's not here anymore. He's went back to glory. He's with the Father. And so the body of Christ now needs to go and do the work they've been called to do. So the chronology of reconciliation, how did it all happen? Go back to the Garden of Eden. God and man walked side by side, didn't they? They fellowshiped. All of a sudden, sin entered the picture. Instead of looking toward each other, they turned away from each other. Sin created a barrier. Sin created a gap. God, a holy God, could not look upon sin. Man, and he sinned, didn't want to look at God. Remember, man hid from God. He didn't want God to find him. So go a little bit further. We see here then, after the fall, what happened? And then we go to Calvary. We just celebrated Easter here not too long ago. And at Calvary, God, through Christ, 
turned his face back toward man. God then looked back toward man, and, and man is still in his sinful condition. God's looking at man. He's looking at the world. He's not just looking at some, but he's looking at the world. And he's, he's looking at the, the world with the idea that now we can be reconciled. We don't need to be enemies anymore. We can now be friends. You can be children of mine. But the idea is we have to, man has to make that decision. A conversion. Remember we talked about that. Repentance and faith. Man turns his face toward God. Remember? Repentance. I turn from the world, turn from sin, turn from my rejection of Christ. Faith. I look to God and put my faith in His Son, in the finished work of His Son on Calvary. So we got those two more words uh, that we can talk about now to understand. We have the, the reconciliation. We have substitution. We have conversion we talked about. And the next time we get together, we'll get into perpetuation and a few more. God bless. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for this day. and we, Lord, we can't thank You enough for the work that Your Son did when He came down to this earth and born in that manger, lived on this earth, ministered for 33, for lived here for 33 years, ministered for 33 and a half years, and how it all culminated when He went to the cross and He shed His blood to make all this possible. Without that shedding of blood, there'd be no hope for mankind. But we thank You for the obedience of Your Son, and we pray that we'd be found faithful to be obedient to You and to Your Word, and we'll thank and praise You for what You're going to do. In Jesus' name, Amen.